Good morning. I'm Darrell West, Vice President of Governance Studies and Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. And I would like to welcome you to the seventh annual John Hazen White uh, Manufacturing uh, Forum. And we are webcasting uh, this event live, so we'd like to welcome our viewers from around the country and uh, indeed around the world. Uh, we have a Twitter feed set up at hashtag USMFG. That's USMFG for manufacturing, uh, if you wish to uh, post any comments uh, during the forum. So we have several uh, distinguished guests uh, with us. Uh, our benefactor, John Hazen White, is here with us, uh, along with his uh, wife, uh, Liz, uh, sons, uh, John and Ben, and daughters-in-law, uh, Kirsten and Caitlin. Uh, so we uh, appreciate the support of the entire family in making this forum uh, possible. So uh, please join me in uh, thanking them for their uh, generosity. So today we want to look at the manufacturing sector and focus on ways to improve output and employment. In previous years, we have looked at obstacles facing the industry and ways to overcome them. Uh, this week, we put out a new global manufacturing scorecard that examines how the United States compares to 18 other uh, nations. And this report is online at Brookings uh, EDU. Uh, and the report uh, finds that China is the top nation in terms of manufacturing output. South Korea excels in the percentage of its national output generated by manufacturing. And Poland actually has the highest percentage of its workforce engaged in uh, manufacturing. To see what factors contributed to manufacturing success, we developed an index uh, for these countries in which we looked at the policies, taxes, uh, energy, uh, workforce uh, quality, and infrastructure issues. And we found that the top countries in terms of its overall environment uh, for manufacturing uh, were the United Kingdom, uh, Switzerland, and the United States. And I will refer you to the paper for uh, details on how we reach those uh, conclusions uh, and uh, the implications uh, of those. I think most importantly is at the end of the paper, we make a number of recommendations for improving the manufacturing uh, climate. And uh, I'll just briefly enumerate them. Uh, one, that it's important to have a strategy that emphasizes political and economic predictability. This obviously is important for the business community. Uh, having open trade uh, policies as a way to promote uh, international commerce. Providing financial incentives for innovation, education, and workforce development. Deploying 21st century tools such as artificial intelligence and data analytics to upgrade manufacturing processes helping small firms through research and workforce development, and finally, improving infrastructure in order to support manufacturing supply chains and uh, delivery uh, systems. I developed some of these ideas in my new book, The Future of Work, uh, Robots, AI, and Automation. Uh, in that, I uh, cover the changing workforce that needs and how to address uh, these workforce issues during a time of accelerating uh, innovation. And the book is available in the Brookings uh, Bookstore uh, right outside the uh, auditorium after uh, this event. To help us understand manufacturing challenges and opportunities, we have a number of distinguished experts. Uh, to my immediate uh, right is John Hazen White, who's the president of Takeo Comfort Solutions. Uh, he is the third generation of his family to lead the company. He's a big proponent of workforce development and bringing innovative practices uh, to his company and uh, the sector as a whole. And he also is a, a Brookings uh, trustee. The Honorable David Cicilline is a member of Congress from Rhode Island. He was elected to Congress in 2010. Uh, there he works on issues related to uh, manufacturing as well as uh, a number of other issues. Uh, he has introduced the Make It in America legislation uh, that uh, is designed to retrain American uh, workers and improve uh, U.S. manufacturing policy. Also with us is Allison uh, uh, Grios. Uh, she is the president of Women in Manufacturing. Uh, that is a national trade association uh, focused on supporting and promoting women in the manufacturing sector. Uh, she also is the vice president of membership and association services at the Precision Metal Forming Association. Uh, that is a trade association representing the metal forming uh, industry. 
So I want to start with uh, Johnny. So one of the recommendations of our report is the United States should pursue a strategy that is predictable and follows open trade policies. Uh, that has been uh, America's approach for uh, many uh, decades now. But of course, President Trump is moving in a different direction. He has imposed tariffs, and he's talking tough with China, Europe, uh, Mexico, and Canada. Now, you are on the front lines of uh, manufacturing uh, with your uh, uh, firm, uh, Takeo uh, Comfort Solutions. How is his tariff policy and general trade rhetoric affecting your company? Well, um, you know, as I've talked about over the years at this event, you know, the, the one thing we don't do is, is uh, uh, chase cheap labor. You know, we, we don't move around the world for, for the purpose of low labor. But in the manufacturing business, it's, it's critically important to be sure we are, at least in my segment, uh, critically important to be sure we're able to purchase material at worldwide best price because it's a, a huge component of our P&L. So uh, the, the tariffs, uh, I haven't agreed with, with this concept you know, since the campaign, frankly, because, uh, uh, because it's concerning. Uh, a huge amount of the, a huge portion of the cost of, of most of my products is, uh, you know, is, is, is material purchased from China. So on two fronts, number one, uh, this will, and I want to circle back to, to the whole issue in a second, but this will uh, cause companies like, like Taco uh, to have to raise our prices and pass, pass some of this cost on. We can't absorb uh, uh, what's being proposed here. Um, the second thing is it's, it's going to uh, cause companies like mine to need to source elsewhere. So uh, whether we go to, to India or Mexico or Brazil or, or, or wherever, we're going to need to now invest in more uh, sources of supply, and that's very costly uh, to a company like mine. I, I, you know, I, if there's one thing I've learned about uh, President Trump is uh, he, he's unpredictable. And, um, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. You know, a lot of well, what some might take it in a derogatory <laughs> yeah, sense. Yeah, whatever. You, know, you can count not... me in that group. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, David. <laughs> oh, but uh, but you know, I I, uh, I think a lot of uh, let's wait and see what happens. You know, he, he, he's one of those where you got to wait and see what what the end result is. And who knows if this will really uh, flow through? But. Um, but I think it is concerning. Uh, by the way, I highly recommend to, to, to you folks to read this book of Daryl's. It's, okay. it's, uh, it's a great read. It's an easy read. I read it in Lafayette Park the other day. What could be more appropriate, reading my book right it's across like from the White House? Read anything <laughs> of day, right? yeah, I'm sitting in front of the White House. With... <laughs> Uh, so let me bring uh, Congressman Cicilline into this. So you have uh, worked on trade and manufacturing in Congress. What role should members play in trade policy, and how is Congress dealing with Trump, particularly on tariff issues? Well, you know, I, we have uh, a number of proposals that have both been enacted and are pending before the Congress to help rebuild and strengthen American manufacturing. So Congress clearly has a role, and while we're doing that, the president is engaged in this uh, tariff effort, some call it resulting in a trade war. But I think one of the challenges is that, uh, you know, in the normal course, presidents kind of go through this consideration of tariffs in a very kind of deliberate, thoughtful way where you bring in your economic advisors, your trade representative, you sort of understand what are the implications of a tariff, what's the likely response to be, what's the kind of aggregated impact on the economy, both in this country and around the world. And you make judgments, very careful judgments, about how to impose tariffs to respond to a specific problem. I don't think many of us don't get the sense that that sort of deliberative process happened and that the president uses tariffs more as a way to kind of make a political argument. And I think the consequences of that are we are headed for a serious trade war, and despite what the president says, there aren't, you know, they're not easy to win. It's not good for the economy. It's not good for American manufacturing. It's not good for American consumers. That is not to say there are not bad actors in this space, and the United States has a responsibility to respond to that, but it needs to be very targeted, very specific, and uh, I think with the kind of precision that doesn't have much larger economic implications. So I think Congress's role uh, has to 
really present to the administration what we think are good principles for trade policy. Uh, and then it's the president's responsibility to negotiate trade agreements that achieve those principles. Uh, we've tried to do that, but um, you know, I think there's some disagreement even within the Congress on, there are some people who think you know, we should have open trade completely with almost no limitations. There are other people who think trade policy needs to be balanced, it needs to be fair and free. We need to be sure there are environmental standards, there are labor standards, there are uh, ways to prevent currency manipulation that don't, that don't put the U.S. As a, at a disadvantage. So I think you know, we can have good trade policies if we approach it with a real understanding that we want fair and free trade and we want to protect good American jobs and good American businesses, that it's not one or the other. We can have trade policy which achieves both. Okay. Uh, so, Allison, you work on issues of interest to the metal forming industry. So, I have two questions. First of all, what is the metal forming industry, just so we understand uh, what it is uh, you're uh, working with? Uh, and then, secondly, uh, how are Trump's policies affecting your particular firms and sector? Sure. So, I work with the Precision Metal Forming Association. We are 75 years strong. And we represent nearly 800 individual companies, most of which are small to mid-sized, uh, most, most of which are family-owned, privately held um, businesses that very much are being impacted by these recent decisions as they relate to steel tariffs. You know, there was this bit of relief and, and kind of excitement around tax reform as it happened. Companies were, were feeling excited about capital, capital investments that they could make in their companies. They felt like it was a great position for them to be even more competitive. And, and sadly, these tariffs have completely undone what was that excitement and that certainty that our small to mid-sized manufacturing companies had. Our members have been very vocal and are now part of a coalition actually trying to take action and build awareness about this impact of the tariffs. You know, making co companies, sadly, now less competitive globally, um, where material, as John said, is a large part of their cost. Our metal forming industry, metal farm companies, for the most part, are making stamped component parts, parts that are, are parts of assemblies that are on other automobile appliances <coughs> in the country. And metal for them is such a large piece of their piece price. And so to not be able to be competitive and to now not be able to source competitively to other countries is really difficult. A member of ours who's been very vocal, Bill Adler, a small, again, manufacturer in Cleveland, Ohio, um, has been all over the news talking about you know places where he was able to bid and thought he had a good chance. He's now had to pull out of the bidding process because because of the material price, he can't be competitive. And so that, that work will go global and go to not a U.S. manufacturer, which I don't think was the intention of these tariffs to begin with. So, so we're trying to get our members to be vocal, to share that impact. Obviously, hope, we talked this morning about numbers in our pre-con, and hopefully we can gather that data of this larger impact beyond just our small membership. Um, but it's, it's not serving the purpose that it was intended to do, and sadly, just having a, a negative effect on our small to mid-sized manufacturers. Can I, can I add one sure. thing? Uh, just, just an afterthought. Uh, True to our system, our economic system, uh, whether people, suppliers are affected by the tariffs or not, everybody grabs this opportunity to raise price. All right. You know, so all of our costs are going up regardless of the, the, the origin. And so often it can't be passed along to the customer. And so therein lies this challenge. How do you maintain <coughs> and grow a customer relationship if you're, if you're then you know, trying to pass along this additional cost? How do you then become this choice supplier? And, and so it's a very difficult place where many of our companies are in. So and sadly, there's impact with layoffs. I mean, I, I think it's been shown in the media over the last few days. I mean, this is causing small to mid-sized and large-sized companies now to have to look to layoffs, to now smaller um, size their organizations and their companies, which, again, was this really meant to be the impact? No. Right. Could not be. <laughs> uh, Johnny, let me come back uh, to you. So in my book, I talk about using uh, things like AI, robotics, and data analytics to upgrade the manufacturing uh, process. So how is technology changing manufacturing, and what have you done uh, in your uh, firm to introduce uh, technology into manufacturing processes? Well, we, we um, the AI, uh, artificial intelligence, part of this kind of spooks me a little bit. I was at a friend's house the other Day and he has an Echo B thermostat, which is uh, rigged up somehow with Alexa. Oh, yes. So when I came in, he said, Alexa, play Willie Nelson. So it, <laughs> the house was full of Willie Nelson. So I'm thinking to myself, it, it, this thing's listening. Right? Not, not a good thing, <laughs> um, in my, my opinion. But uh, on the robotic part of this, uh, 
We've been investing in productivity for years, since I was running the company 25 years ago. And as a result uh, of the efficiencies brought by investment, it's not robotics to replace jobs, in, in my case. What we've been able to do is to take a $30 million company in 1992 with 500 people and drive it up to 250 million with 500 people, you know? And they're the same 500 people for the most part. Uh, and that's through efficiency, you know, because the, the, the most costly part of any, any operation, obviously, is the people. And so you want to maximize uh, the power that you have with the people you have. That's my thought. I mean, people are the, absolutely the greatest asset any of us uh, uh, can, can have, right? So to, uh, to empower them with, with productivity gains and, and whatnot has allowed families to prosper and grow and develop. And I, I've never, uh, so I think to continue to do that, I would, I would uh, want to bring my company to, to th four or five hundred million dollars with, with 500 people. Yeah, I, th I think there's some real gains to be had there. Congressman, what opportunities do you see to use technology to improve manufacturing, and are there particular things that Congress should do to promote technology innovation? Well, I, I think the ex uh, example that Johnny gave is a example maybe very peculiar to Takeo. I mean, this is a company that has a long record of valuing its employees who are treated more like family members than than employees. But I think that the more challenging example is a company that sees a doubling of their output and a reduction in their size of their workforce. So even Johnny's example, I'd like to see us go even further with the same 500. I'm not sure that's the experience in a lot of manufacturing. Two thirds of the manufacturing jobs that we've lost have been to automation and the other third to bad trade deals. So this issue of automation um, is a very serious challenge. And I think we don't have like uh, a lot of easy kind of answers to it. I think there are huge opportunities. What, what I've recently done in the National Defense uh, Authorization Act is to require the Secretary of Defense to do an analysis and report on what's the impact on the defense industrial base of automation, kind of understanding what, what the challenges is, but both the opportunities and challenges, because it's exciting and it helps to fuel innovation and there's all kinds of wonderful consequences, but we need to understand what it means for the kind of jobs that will be available, what will those jobs require, how many will there be, and that sort of impact. So I think Congress has a responsibility to begin to really study this and understand and figure out how do we uh, sort of adjust to what is very likely to be in the manufacturing space, huge uh, advancements in innovation, huge advancements in automation, and maybe not huge advancements in job creation. And sort of how do you... Uh, respond to that with good policies that incentivize the right things so that we're not uh, just growing manufacturing without growing good manufacturing jobs. And I don't think, you know, I think, to be very honest, I think a lot of public policy uh, individuals and politicians sort of avoid this because there's not a really easy answer. Some of it's about job training and skill development. Some of it's about tax policy. But there's no, I mean, this is a challenge, and I, I'm sure you have the answers in your new book. But I, sure I, I do. Good. So. <laughs> I knew that. Just read As the a last former two student of so. Professor West, I'm sure. But I think this is, a, we have a responsibility at least to begin to raise these issues and let the American people know we're, we're thinking about them carefully. We recognize that there are both opportunities and challenges that this rapid acceleration of innovation and, and automation present. So, uh, Allison, how is technology being used in your sector? So, you know, I, I think the intention, manufacturing 4.0 or smart manufacturing isn't intended to replace jobs. It, it, it's intended to create new and different jobs. So I was at recently at a conference a few weeks ago in DMDII, one of these innovation centers created by President Obama in Goose Island, Illinois, talked about a report they recently did with McKinsey. So they talked about the jobs of the future, the jobs of the next 10, 20 years, and they're all jobs that don't exist present day. So automation isn't necessarily going to re replace all of those people in present production or at the front lines. It's going to create jobs we don't even think of today. You know, skill sets that are new and different, and that's why these manufacturing jobs could be and should be very attractive to millennials and women. That is one of our key audiences. You know, our small to mid-sized companies, the Precision Metal Forming Association that we represent, um, they're just trying to now yet 
get started on their innovation journey. So looking at how does the smart manufacturing that their customers are using in this, this um, interactiveness of their machines to production to output, how does that relate to them as a supplier? The bulk of our members um, are tier two, tier three suppliers, uh, very few direct suppliers, but they're trying to figure out how do they integrate this technology and automation into their own facilities. Obviously, automation can be you know, a solution for much of the workforce challenges that our industry has. Again, not replacing jobs, but, but being one of those um, you know, ancillary places to which you can find help support when you can't fill these 300 to 400,000 jobs that we have to fill and many more to fill in years to come. So, I Allison, just add one thing. To, I think that also uh, reinforces the urgency of much closer alignment between the private sector, higher education, uh, and the kind of job training space because, you know, <coughs> as we try to imagine what those jobs are, being able to skill people up quickly with the skills that they need to enter into those jobs is going to be really critical. And rather sort of waiting until the jobs are there and like, oh, now we have to train people, anticipating that with lots of good co coordination, which leads nicely into the Make in America Manufacturing Communities Act, which is designed to do exactly that, to take the private sector, the public sector, the university, higher education, uh, you know, and figure out how you develop these you know, manufacturing ecosystems for your present needs and also to help anticipate what your workforce needs are going forward. I think it's really critical. And you're exactly right. There certainly are going to be lots of new jobs uh, created. In the short run, though, the challenge is going to be many Americans are not going to have the skills for this job. So it does place an emphasis on uh, workforce development and uh, retraining. Uh, Allison, I want to come back to you because I know you also are president of women in manufacturing. So how do you see these issues playing out for uh, women, either in terms of automation, technology innovation, uh, workforce development, and, and what are you doing to try and uh, promote Women in manufacturing. So Women in Manufacturing, we're a national association that I started in 2010, 2011, with a core focus on supporting, promoting, and inspire, inspiring women in manufacturing with a very um, single focus on women who have selected careers in manufacturing. So we look at this audience of right now 29% of the manufacturing workforce, and our goal is to help them advance in manufacturing, have the right training and education to help them as they, they look for new opportunities, as they look to grow their careers, ideally making their way to the C-suite. And then equally important, and why we first got started, was to create a network. So I, working in the metal forming industry for 17 years, found that I was often the only female at conferences, events, industry trade shows and thought, this is really lonely. There's lots of women who are out there who are talented, educated, excited about manufacturing, but sadly they don't have this cohort of individuals to converse with. So we created this national organization, and we see these manufacturing careers of the future as a very exciting opportunity to get women excited about manufacturing. So things that they may get excited about in their own personal journey in life, um, these are things that can be applied directly to manufacturing careers. So one of our key focuses is promoting manufacturing. So changing, unfortunately, a very antiquated perception of what manufacturing is. So we've launched a Hear Her Story campaign that we've now interviewed more than 50 leading women in manufacturing, and our journey continues to talk about what a day in the life looks like for manufacturing. So hopefully this makes its way to educators, career counselors, moms, dads, and aspiring students to find that today's modern manufacturing careers are not what they may think, that there's great automation, there's technology, these things that, they, again, they may use personally, they can apply those in their day-to-day -day career. So we see it as a great opportunity, manufacturing of the future, and our community is very excited about sharing what they're doing personally what their companies are doing to attract a more diverse workforce. So it sounds like you're doing tremendous things. I apologize that you're the only female on this panel as well, <laughs> uh, given your early comments. <laughs> uh, <coughs> a question for everyone on the panel, and then after that we'll open the floor to uh, comments from uh, the audience. So uh, one of the recommendations of our report is just kind of focusing on the important role of infrastructure in manufacturing in terms of uh, supply chains, uh, delivery, and so on. So, uh, Johnny, what do we need to do uh, on infrastructure development in the United States? Oh, that's kind of a, <laughs> that's a softball question. You, you can take a pass if you want. <laughs> no, or, I think. Or you uh, can call a friend. <laughs> <laughs> call a friend, yeah, I have that option. Um, y you know, in, in the United States, I think it's more than just the United States because in the manufacturing, at least in, in, in again, in, in, in our sector, I mean, we're really quite global from a sourcing perspective. Uh, I don't know what the percentage of our uh, material purchases are globally, but it certainly is significant. So, you know, it's the investment around the world in infrastructure. I think it's a big, it's a big question, not only in very basic infrastructure, roads, uh, uh, 
transportation, uh, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think the supply chain at this point uh, is perhaps the biggest opportunity for a company like mine to refine and to save and to, to, to improve. So I think, I think the whole issue of infrastructure, you know, and, and, and I know that the president is working on, on infrastructure, isn't he? Con <laughs> so he claims. We um, on infrastructure? Well, I, I think this is actually one where, uh, and I, I know these are always bipartisan conversations, but this is one where I think the Democrats have really uh, been leading. You know, we launched a uh, better deal for rebuilding America some months ago. This is a trillion dollar investment to rebuild roads, bridges, ports, transit systems, schools, uh, broadband. Uh, because we really understand that, and for manufacturing this is particularly important, the ability of businesses to move goods, services, and information to compete in the 21st century is critical. And we have a deteriorating infrastructure where it is very costly and inefficient very often to move goods, services, and information. If we are going to compete, we ought to be looking at what some of our competitors are doing and making major investments in rebuilding their infrastructure with really world-class infrastructure. That was always sort of America's pride. We had the best infrastructure in the world. Right. It's not the case anymore. Right. And so we have an opportunity, and we really ought to be investing in it in a very significant way, and not, frankly, as the president has suggested, which is a very modest investment mostly private-public partnerships with tolling and fees and basically saying to states and cities, you should be doing more infrastructure. That's actually not a plan. Uh, most states and cities don't have the resources to do it. The federal government needs to be a real partner and make an investment of resources. The value of it, you know, in terms of economic growth and economic impact is well known. It's hugely significant. So we'll get that money back, that return our investment. But there's also, uh, you know, in addition to the physical infrastructure, there also has to be a very serious investment in uh, the kind of technology infrastructure, both in terms of the way information is shared, the way commerce is conducted, and the security around all of that, both customer data, IP. I mean, there's a lot of uh, threats in the kind of current environment and protecting the, you know, the, the data that relates to customers, protecting the data that relates to your own intellectual property around your products. So we have huge opportunities to make investments in those areas that can make a tremendous difference and give American manufacturers, you know, a huge competitive advantage. If, if it suddenly becomes cheaper and easier and faster to move information and goods in the U.S. than many of our competitors, that's a huge benefit to the American people, to our economy, and to American manufacturing. So this is one where there ought to be bipartisan support to get it done. Uh, the plan we put forth will create 16 million good paying jobs will have a real impact on our economy. And it was, you know, sadly, it was always sort of a bipartisan issue. Everyone sort of had infrastructure needs in their district. Um, it's only recently that there's been sort of an unwillingness to approach this in a bipartisan way, and I think that's really disappointing. Allison, your thoughts on infrastructure, then we'll get some questions from the audience. Likewise, I, I think infrastructure improvements and investments are critical, especially for those small to mid-sized manufacturing companies. We talk Earlier, competitive, competitiveness is critical, and the security issue is also critical. So many of our small to mid-sized companies are figuring out how to protect what there is, what is their IP, what is these things that are proprietary to them and their processes. So if we can support in some way this better protection for companies of all sizes and looking at cybersecurity and how do we combat that and how do we deal with protecting you know, what it is that their, their ingenuity that's supporting in the U.S., it's critically important. Okay, let's open the floor to uh, questions from the audience. We have a question right here up front. Yeah, um, one of the key issues that was brought up was uh, material cost, driving up costs. You, know, if you have to import your material. It used to be most of the material was provided available. If we could get a microphone up here, please. from the United States. Right. Okay, uh, so, uh, so the question was on terms of material uh, uh, costs. So anyone? So, go first. yeah, I, I, would, I would say that it, if in, in my case, you know, I can really talk about anything, but, you know, I would co go here, right? In my case, a tremendous amount of my material cost is in cast iron uh, and cast stainless steel. Um, over the years, and, and maybe rightly, uh, uh, we have regulated that source of supply out of business. Okay, 
environmentally. And, and so we're forced to purchase, you know, outside. There, there's some of that still, <coughs> steel, some steel still made here. But um, as we all know that, uh, 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 you're from Pittsburgh, right? So we know what happened in Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm from Erie, so. Okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, th I think we've regulated some of that out of existence, and I don't see that necessarily coming back. I, I would just add one thing. I mean, there is, you know, the only experience I have on this issue is, is really around the Buy America provisions in which we require uh, certain purchases to be made by purchasing goods made or manufactured here in the United States. And I've uh, been working on a piece of legislation and reintroduced it with Senator Murphy to really modernize and kind of update uh, those requirements because they, they very often, it's very easy to get waivers and it's very simple. And so kind of tightening that so that that isn't so easy. But part of that legislation also provides resources for some restarting of some manufacturing we've lost because some of it's environmental and won't come back. Some of it's just there wasn't the market, but now there is. And so with some support... Uh, for some smaller manufacturers to get back into this space, we can start buying American-made goods because they're actually made here. So I think you know there are, are some examples where we can do that. Um, some of the environmental issues, I think, will make that impossible, but there are areas, I think, where we can. And if we can create a marketplace by tightening the Buy American, modernizing those Buy American provisions so we're actually supporting American manufacturing, and then when there's places where people say, look, there's just nobody in the U.S. who makes this, well, can we help create that opportunity by incentivizing that with some U.S. manufacturers, and I think that you can use technology to make it eco-friendly. That's right. Steel development. Of course, absolutely. absolutely. It's an investment, but it, of course you can. And 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 yeah, don't also don't underestimate the investment that some of these other countries have made in this. This is not just about buying something because the labor's cheap, right? right? Exactly. The, China, I will tell you, 25 or 30 years ago, China figured out. That it was a good idea to invest tons of money in cast iron, making cast iron, and they do it well, you know. So uh, there's a little bit of that. So David, whatever you do, whatever we do to to reinvigorate this has to involve, I think, technology is a key Absolutely. to that. Actually, you know, yeah. Uh, right here on the aisle is a question. There's a microphone coming up from behind. <clears throat> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Happy to see you, Congress Sicily, Hazel and Sicily. My name is Rosemary Sagan. Can you talk straight into the microphone like this? My name is, my name is <laughs> Sorry, we'll get you a second microphone. My my name is That's Rosemary better. Seguero. My company is called Seguero's International Group. I focus on uh, manufacturing. I'm part of the U.S. Congress Manufacturing Caucus for many years. And uh, Cecily, thank you so much for involving women. We just had an event on Monday where I was asking in the crowd a summit, how many women are in manufacturing? No women are in manufacturing, light manufacturing, small things. I, Congressman Cecily, my focus is on uh, uh, global immigrants who live in this country, who are Americans uh, and are engineers. Uh, we, 80% of uh, immigrants in this country who are Americans are engineers. They can manufacture, scientists, they can manufacture. But there is a problem that is going on, which I'll talk to you later in your office letter. How can we include them? Uh, immigrants make America great. They still make America great. They are here. So how do we make this happen? Because there is some strain of some kind which I'll talk to you in your office later. So how do we involve this with the Congress to look so that we can also make America great? We are Americans. Live in this country. We want to see it great. Thank you so much. And Cicely, okay, thank so you for your work and supporting women. We'll talk later. Thank you very much. Okay, so the role of uh, immigrants immigrants in American <laughs> manufacturing. Yeah, um, I, I'll say at the outset, I think America is already great. So, uh, but I think, you're, I think you're right. I mean, the, what we have a responsibility to do is recognize that every generation of immigrants has renewed this great democracy and made enormous contributions to our country, to the economy of our country, have brought great talent and ingenuity and innovation. And to the extent that we're not tapping into all of that talent, it is at our own peril. And I think the first thing we need to do is 
pass a bipartisan comprehensive immigration bill so we make sure that folks can you know, work and contribute and come out of the shadows. And, uh, you know, we have a piece of legislation that has been introduced that has been always enjoyed bipartisan support. If it came to the floor, it would pass. The speaker has refused to bring that bill to the floor. Uh, but I think, you know, we, we have a responsibility to fix our broken immigration system and to be sure that we have the opportunity to continue to be a place where people come to build a better life for themselves and their family and bring enormous talent. And uh, this is a challenge because we have, as you say, people who come with incredible skill and very often can't work because they don't have the proper documentation, the proper work papers, whatever. That's, you know, those, those folks are now going to other parts of the world um, which is a real disadvantage to the U.S. We want to be the place that those great scientists and great engineers and great innovators think about coming uh, to create a company and create uh, jobs and uh, success. So this is an urgent priority, not only for the kind of humanitarian implications of having a broken immigration system. We're seeing that play out every day, but also because of the impact it has on long -term, long, short-term and long-term economic health. So I think you're 100% right. <coughs> Uh, this gentleman right here has a question. There's a microphone coming over to you. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask, how do you see China 2025 could impact the future of U.S. manufacturing and competitiveness? And do you think positive or negative, or why the U.S. should be concerned about it? China 2025. I mean, I'll speak to it. I mean, I think, look, uh, China is a competitor to the United States in the area of manufacturing. There's no question about it. They have uh, invested in developing a strategy around it, a very kind of specific and uh, uh, detailed strategy. It ha they, have, of course, have the advantage of being able to execute it in a kind of because of the central control of the government and uh, virtually unlimited resources to sort of execute it. We're competing in a different way with an economy that's a free market and a government that is not centrally controlled in the same way. So I think we should recognize that. It's a, it's a challenge. Uh, they're also very focused on making sure that they expand their markets and make the kind of uh, the transportation of their goods easy. And uh, I think we will continue to have a huge competitive advantage in terms of innovation and the kind of uh, design and sort of creative component of manufacturing that the U.S. still is a, a pioneer, I mean, a leader in. I think it's going to take a long time to catch up, but it's not, you know, it's not a position we're going to hold forever if we're not careful. So investing in STEAM and STEM and investing in, um, you know, career tracks for young people who want to think about a career in manufacturing and in engineering and math and design and, and understanding those kind of intersections. So I think we have to recognize, you know, the U.S. has competitors in this space, and we need to make the right investments to be sure that we can continue to compete successfully. And um, I think in many ways, China 2025 is going to drive the U.S., I hope, to develop a really? national manufacturing policy, Agree to invest that. really seriously in infrastructure, to be serious about STEAM education. And I think it's going to cause us to be uh, sort of step up our game. I, I, Johnny, you want to add? I would, I would just, I, I think that's spot on. And, uh, and I, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of people in China to be employed, right? And so their strategy is, is somewhat revolving around that to, to whatever extent. Also, their, their, their investment in, in, in quality has been significant. You know, it's not what we knew 30 years ago or, or more. And so I, I think there's things, there's always going to be things that, if you want to take China, you can say this about any place, but there's always going to be things that, that they do better than we do or that we don't do uh, that supplement what we do do, okay? Just like we talked about the sourcing material, okay? And uh, so I, I, I think there's a, a real significant role for, for China, obviously just by their mass, right, but, but also their abilities and capabilities uh, to support. It. Remember, every day that goes by, this is not happening slowly. Every day that goes by, this world is becoming much smaller, much with, and, and, and with the whole advent of, of uh, what do you call it, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, things are now happening without, without us, right? Uh, 
the data is being transmitted, the thoughts are being memorized. It's quite amazing. So I think there's a, a place for, for all of us coming together as we move forward. Right now it's a bit of a, you know, but I think that will settle out. Allison, how does China affect the metal forming industry, if, if at all? I, again, I think I think there's motivation there. So I think, similar to your point, I think it's going to motivate small to mid-sized manufacturers to to explore how to become more competitive, how to integrate technology into their everyday operations. Um, you know, they, they, there's global competitiveness everywhere, and so these companies, especially these privately held companies, uh, need to innovate. And I think this will be a motivator for them to do so. David, I just want to one. David, you you had an interesting. A point too, and, and I think you just tagged onto it, Allison. The, the um, uh, you know, years ago in my business, my biggest competitor, uh, one night, over the Telex machine. Do you know what a Telex is? <laughs> um, dropped the price forty percent of our core product, and we weren't making money on it to begin with, and it forced us. It forced us to either stay in or get out. Right? We stayed in. And we became a world leader because they pushed us to improve. And, and, and I think not only China, but some of these other magnificent countries who are coming out of, of their shell right, are going to force us to continue to, to improve. You know? And it's a good thing. So it's the best thing that could happen to us. So I think, I think there's a real partnership there you know, and what, what's happening. Okay, other questions? Sorry. Uh, in the back, there's a microphone coming from over there. Hey, good morning, Mario Rubello. Uh, first, two-part question. First part was for Congressman Cicilline. And if you could hold the microphone up. Sure. If you tell us where, you, where you're from. Yeah, right, where are you from? From Providence, Rhode Island, <laughs> Fox Point. <laughs> okay. Two-part question. First part for the, for the Congressman, my Congressman. Um, what, what is, should be the role of states or cities in advancing U.S. manufacturing, knowing that we have some speed bumps here at the federal level and also with, within Congress, let's, let's admit it, but what, can things, what are some of the things that states and cities should be doing to address these issues? Because I think that's very important. Then the second part is for John, knowing that we're, you're in a high-cost state, especially for manufacturing, and there's very little of it in Rhode Island. We need more of it. What would you say is the, really the one or two things on a go-forward basis that both the state and the city need to do to really help you move to that half a $500 million uh, growth of your company? Because I, I think this, so it's a two-part question, but it's still related, and we just would welcome your input. So I, I would say um, for states, at least for the New England states for sure, you know, listening to what manufacturers tell you they need to be successful and to grow for sure, addressing the issue of energy costs, a very big issue for manufacturers, particularly manufacturers that use, consume a lot of energy. So being smart about investments you're making to, to uh, increase your ability to access <coughs> low-cost energy and reducing the cost of energy. I think two is workforce development, making sure that you're really investing both in the kind of career and technical schools and you know, early ways to kind of change, as Allison said, sort of the old narrative about what manufacturing is so young people think about a career in manufacturing. Um, I think we're getting out of a period when people thought manufacturing was dark and dirty and unhealthy and unsafe. And if a kid came home and said, Mom, Dad, I want to be a manufacturer, they said, no, you're not. You know, we have to change that. And we can do a lot in our education system and career and technical schools to change that. But investing in a really serious job training and education program that has a manufacturing track to it and then I think thinking about what are available at the state and local level in terms of economic development tools and tax policy and enterprise zones to create spaces to bring down the cost of manufacturing. Maybe one of the only good things in my view in the tax bill that was passed by the Republicans in the House was a provision that allows the designation of enterprise zones and communities that can really be used to help support manufacturing. So I, th I would say those three areas would be the three priorities I would uh, recommend. So I would, I think it's an interesting question. You know, what can cities and, and town, uh, the states do? Uh, you, you know, as we've begun to evolve TACO over the last couple of years, uh, we've, we've hit this period that I call a threshold uh, period where we must now jump to a whole different 
company than we have been for the last 30 years. So we brought in some, some outside um, consultants to work with us, a guy from Detroit named Larry Simon, who, in my opinion, has been one of the greatest blessings that, that, that's ever walked through the front door. And the reason is because he's forced us to think differently. And so we're turning rocks all over the place. And I'm going to answer your question just really, really basically. From my standpoint, I've never been a big fan of, of having the government involved in what I do. But I, I, I do find in the past six or eight months that we've begun to ask the questions. How can you help us? I get Alan Fung, in the, the mayor of Cranston, we're the largest employer in the city of Cranston, uh, a couple of months ago and said, what can you do to help? Well, they changed our property tax program, right? Not bazillions of dollars, but you know what? Every bit counts. And it, it's a matter of thinking differently. So now we've gone to the state and we've brought in the economic, the, uh, the commerce people to see what, what the state can do. I don't know what's there. I've never looked. I've never asked. But I think that, that, there, that, that in the state of Rhode Island, when you have a TACO, okay, who's one of the last, you know, remaining manufacturers of its size, employing that many people, it's in everybody's best interest to find ways to help it stay there. You know, because it is a high cost state and it's, it, look, I was born and raised there. For me to run a business there is, is, is not so complicated, but to bring somebody in to that place, <clears throat> it's a very small state with, you know, and, and uh, quite, uh, quite inter, interrelated with one another all over the place. And so it's, it'd be hard to bring, bring, have somebody bring their business there and get it. I was born and raised there, so I get it, right? I'm, I'm one of those, probably one of the parts of the problem. But uh, Small state with big ideas. <laughs> small state with big ideas and a couple of big fish in that little <laughs> tiny pond, right? But, uh, but you know it's a matter of asking questions, and, 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 and they're coming forth. That's a very basic answer, you know, but... Uh, Allison, your thoughts on what <coughs> states and cities yeah. can do? I, I think likewise, it, it's about partnership and communication. So as you <coughs> talked about kind of seeking information, going to kind of the state level and figure out what are those programs and activities that we can do to perhaps get funding to be supplemented. You know, yesterday at our headquarters in Cleveland, Ohio, we had someone come uh, for ta from TAC asking how can we reach your small to mid-sized members and all of the states to talk to them about um, how we can help save them $75,000. So there's programs like that all over the country and sadly there's miscommunication and a lack of communication between agencies and the state and federal government too often to these manufacturers to help them aw be aware of all of these opportunities to save money, to cut costs. Um, apprenticeships is a big thing for our ma manufacturing member companies. So figuring out a way that's more affordable for companies to invest in apprenticeship programs is hugely important. Many of our companies, especially on the East Coast, th they want to have apprentice apprentices. They want to have a, a real formalized program, but so often it's really difficult and costly for them as a small to mid-sized manufacturer. Right. So how do we offset that cost? We have to build this new generation, this next generation of manufacturing talent, and making it difficult and costly for small to mid-sized manufacturers, again, doesn't make sense. Rhode Island is looking very carefully oh, at this. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have uh, time for one more question. There's a gentleman <coughs> right here on the aisle. There's a microphone coming over to you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you. Sandy Apgar, CSIS. What's the role of think tanks, not just Brookings, but AEI, CSIS, and so on, in this resurgence, manufacturing resurgence? Critical. I mean, what we're trying to do is uh, both research and policy advocacy. So research just so we get an understanding of uh, what's uh, going on. Uh, my colleague uh, Mark Miro is here from our Metropolitan uh, program. So they do a lot of work on geographic disparities. Uh, what are the cities that are doing well? What are the cities that are doing poorly? So I think there's a wealth of uh, research that uh, comes out of the institution. But then secondly, we're not doing research just for the sake of doing research. We want research that actually has an impact. Uh, so in the books that we write, the reports we put out, the blog posts that we write, we always try and focus on recommendations. Like there always are particular problems, but we don't want to focus just on the problem. What can we do about the problem? So uh, that's what uh, we're trying to do. And I think through uh, Johnny's help, uh, the manufacturing initiative uh, that we have put together uh, here is designed to really uh, push that to a much higher level so that there will be uh, even more activities. Uh, I think place. this is one of the only programs of its type actually in a think tank. 
think here, can I just, may I just add one thing? I think the other thing that think tanks, Brookings is a great example, but other think tanks as well, also doing an evaluation about a particular policy uh, proposal. You know, we generate lots of ideas in Congress that we think are swell, uh, but it's always useful to have an outside validator who's actually done an analysis and said this is this will work as it's intended to work or this won't work as it's expected to work. So I think that outside analysis and then either validation or criticism is very, very valuable. And just to add one quick uh, footnote to that, we just published a, a blog post in which we suggested that you know, when we kind of think ahead to the workforce over the next 10, 20, and 30 years, like it's going to be a time of great change, lots of technology innovation, changes in uh, business models. We need an appropriate policy response for that new reality. But it's not always clear, you know, what the best programs are going to be. So in this blog post, we suggested that what states should be doing, what the federal government should be doing, is starting to run a bunch of pilot projects to test different ideas, liberal ideas, moderate ideas, conservative ideas, with an evaluation component so that we can actually start to think about how we can respond but have our responses informed by evidence. So I think that's uh, an idea that uh, really uh, uh, we should uh, push. Uh, we're out of time on uh, this panel, but I want to thank uh, uh, John Hayes and White, uh, Congressman Cicilline, and Allison. Uh, great job, and then we'll move to our uh, next uh, panel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.